In addition, he is the C5 AI chair from 2019. Uh, you know, before that, he did his PhD in Oxford and has been doing a bunch of exciting work involving multi-agents. And I'm sure you have come across his papers like Lola and you know other work he did on how teams of our agents can coordinate with each other. So with that, Jacob, you know, please take the floor away. I'm super excited to hear you speak. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, my, the goal of my research is to understand and address the challenges associated with learning in a multi-agent world. So the question is, how can we do machine learning in a world that contains other learning agents? And that's kind of relevant because it happens to be the world that we live in. So let me first explain some of the things I mean by multi-agent settings. So the very obvious ones are systems where you have a number of different agents that have some sort of partial observability and have to cooperate together. So here, all the different swarms, the different robots in the swarm can only observe a little patch of land below them, and they have to work together to rescue this victim in the desert. And that's sort of like the most vanilla multi-agent system that probably any of us can think about. However, there are more systems that maybe don't look multi-agent on the surface. Um, generative adversarial networks or many other machine learning systems consist of multiple different parts that are optimizing different losses. In this case, it's the generator and the discriminator. And that's obviously a system that can be thought of as a multi-agent and it's challenging because when different uh, agents optimizing different losses, really weird things can happen as we can see in the second part of the talk. The same applies to traffic settings, where typically we think of different humans having different intentions, and this can lead to uh, very undesired outcomes. But nowadays, obviously, we're also at the point where there's going to be autonomous vehicles. So we have a general sum partial observable setting with uh, autonomous and, and human agents in one environment, which is highly complex. And lastly, something that's been very close to my heart uh, recently is the setting of human AI coordination, where we have a human and a robot uh, acting together. So in my case, I actually don't really have robotic systems yet, um, but hopefully we'll get there one day. In all of these settings, something that is very core are the so-called, what I call the three Cs. And they consist of, first of all, cooperation. What I mean by that is the ability of enticing others to work together. The second C is communication or exchanging information with other agents. And then the third C is coordination. And by this, I mean working effectively with others when there's a limited amount of common knowledge between the different parties. Throughout this talk, I'll be using the framework of reinforcement learning and the MDP to make progress because that's very general. You probably don't know it, so a quick recap. You have the environment on the right-hand side and you have the agent on the left-hand side. The agent obtains observations O and rewards R from the environment and takes action U. Upon this action, the environment transitions to a new state S prime that's sum from distribution that's conditional on the previous state S and the previous action U. Importantly, while the agent is learning, the transition dynamics of the environment are typically assumed to be static. And this means that the agent can interact with this environment over and over again to maximize the total expected return per episode, which is nothing but the discounted sum of rewards over time. I'll be using deep reinforcement learning, where we represent this agent uh, with a deep neural network that maps from high dimensional observations to actions. And that's because I'm interested in building methods that can really be applied in highly complex and ideal, ideally real world settings at some point in the future. In all these settings, the agent will be parameterized by the weights theta shown here. Because I care about multi-agent learning, clearly having one agent isn't quite enough. So instead we'll have the red agent, the blue agent, and the green agent, and in general, they receive their own observations, O, their own rewards, R, and take their own actions, U. What makes these settings challenging is that, in general, the transition dynamics depend not just on the action of one of the agents, but on the joint actions of, of all of these agents in the environment. Are there any questions so far? If not, um, I will proceed. And the first thing I want to talk about in a bit more detail is the question of how agents can entice others to cooperate. Imagine a world in which all autonomous cars are controlled by one big company. Clearly in this case, there might never be a conflict of interest because this company could completely control how all the cars interact and maximize one joint global objective, which is the total travel time for all users. 
Instead, we know that the world looks like that picture I showed earlier on. We have a variety of different users that have their own intents and are trying to pursue their own goals. This is commonly uh, exemplified by the iterated prisoners dilemma, where we have two prisoners, uh, A and B, Alice and Bob, that were caught robbing a bank. And if both of them remain silent, they get one year in prison each. However, the incentive is for each of them to defect uh, against their, their counterpart by telling that the other party robbed the bank, in which case they will always receive one year less in prison, which means that the, in a single shot game, the only equilibrium outcome, the only national equilibrium is to defect no matter what the other party is doing. However, because they're really bad at robbing banks, they get caught robbing the bank every single day. And as a consequence, Alice and Bob can now entice the other party to collaborate. The issue is that our most common multi-agent learning method is based on naive learning. And in naive learning, there is a very simple approximation, which is we assume that all other agents are part of the environment. So from the perspective of the red agent here, the multi-agent problem has kind of disappeared because each agent simply treats every other agent as being part of this new world. The issue is that if those other agents are learning, the environment now becomes non-stationary. And you may think, well, I've come across non-stationarity before, you know, the world's non-stationary, the weather is changing, stocks go up and down, but this non-stationarity is different because unlike other exogenous factors that change independently of the red agent's actions, in the case of multiple learning agents, the change of agents in the environment is a direct consequence of the actions that this red agent took. And that means rather than just tracking the non-stationarity, we should account for the fact that our actions are changing the environment down the road. And obviously naive learning simply cannot do this. Why is that? Because naive learning represents other agents as being static and therefore miss the fact that they're changing. And perhaps unsurprisingly, when you do this in the iterated prisoner's dilemma, these agents simply learn to defect in all states. And that you can think of as being the worst case outcome where cars simply crash into each other. We address this problem with a paper that Polkett mentioned in the very beginning of the introduction, uh, Lola, whereby each agent simply models other agents as being learning. And therefore the blue agent can now account for the fact that other agents will change their parameters theta two in the next learning steps. And the Lola agent differentiates through that update in the parameters to account for the fact how the agents, how their actions are changing the future behavior of agents in the environment. It turns out that making this very simple change to the um, objective of the agent during learning has a drastic impact on the learning outcome. In particular, these Lola agents now manage to entice other agents to collaborate by playing strategies like tit for tat. So when two Lola agents are trained together in the, in the environment at test time, they will cooperate with each other. And what's important here is they will not cooperate simply by maximizing the joint value function. Because remember, by design, we're assuming that the rewards are exogenous, they're giving to us a priori. We can only change our policies. Obviously, if you could design the problem setting, you would simply make all the problem settings fully cooperative because they're much easier. But we can't change the rewards of different drivers in the environment by assumption. Instead, what we can do is we can try and find methods that obtain better equilibria when being trained together. And you can think of this as being the equivalent of smoothly flowing traffic in, in, our, in our environment. Are there any questions so far? because I assume uh, some of this work maybe you've also seen before. We've extended this work to stable opponent shaping. Uh, here, the idea is very simple that rather than always trying to shape the other opponent, which can lead to undesired uh, equilib equilibria, when we are converging, we require that we're converging to something where the gradients are actually zero. And if you do this, you can indeed address uh, things like GANs, the example I showed in the, in the initial slide, where we can now stably learn this distribution of Gaussians on the, on the bottom, while naive learning is going to collapse to a single mode in this distribution. If there are no questions, I'll proceed to the second C. So once we've enticed other agents to, to cooperate with us, often cooperation requires communication. So that's gonna be the second C in my talk. And that's obviously very, very relevant 
because humans spend between 50 and 80 percent of their workday communicating. And this isn't always easy, right? In particular, in a world where we all live in, uh, have to communicate on Zoom, we all know that communication can be very challenging, and yet it's obvious that our agents in the future will have to communicate both with humans and with other agents in the, in the environment. In this part of the talk, I'll be using the DECPOMDP, the Decentralized Partial Observable Market Decision Process, which is a lot like my general multi-agent framework introduced before with one caveat. All agents in this setting share the same reward function R. And that means while it's partially observable, it's fully cooperative. But all agents are working together in one team. And that's because I've assumed that I can establish cooperation. Once I have established co cooperation, how can agents now learn to communicate with each other? And this is something that we addressed in one of our very early papers in 2016, um, with the paper called Learning to Communicate with Deep Multi-Agent Reinforcement Learning. And this paper, again, was based on a very simple intuition, which is that if you have a sender and a recipient in the environment, or if every agent is sending and receiving messages, then these messages will have a downstream effect on other agents in the environment. And if those messages are based on sheep talk, whereby my messages have no other impact on the environment apart from changing the future behavior of the other agents, then I can actually learn better protocols by sending messages from the center to the recipient and returning gradients. And these gradients are basically like a feedback signal that says this is how the center should update their protocol to send more informative messages. However, this is missing something crucial. It's missing the fact that at least for me, communication is about understanding the points of views of others, understanding beliefs and understanding how my actions will change the future beliefs of other agents in the environment. And that ability is what I refer to as theory of mind. So imagine that you're cycling down the road in London and you see a person next to a bus stop raise their hand. Immediately, you know that there must be a bus behind you. And that's because the person next to the bus stop wouldn't be raising their hand if there wasn't a bus that they can signal you to, to stop. And that ability of humans to understand the actions of others when observing them and to take actions that are informative when being observed by others is what I refer to as theory of mind and what is crucial to communication between humans. And the question is, how can we start developing methods that allow us to bring this ability to AI agents and that allow us to ultimately train agents that have that same kind of reasoning ability. And I believe that one of the great test bits for this is Hanabi. Can I have a quick show of hands, quick wave? Who knows Hanabi in the, in the audience? Okay, so I'll give you a quick rundown. There's one main thing about Hanabi and that is it's fully cooperative. So as I said before, I'm interested in many, many things. I'm not interested in beating humans at their favorite game, okay? In contrast, in Hanabi, everyone is working together as one team, but there's a huge amount of partial observability. And that's because it's not that I can not see your cards, I can not see my own cards. I'm holding my cards away from myself. And the goal in Hanabi is to actually build these stacks of cards that start with the one, and end with a five, one stack for each color. But remember, you can see my cards, I can't see my cards. So that means I have to reason over why you took the actions you took in order to understand what I should be doing next. And obviously this is a comedy P, it's fully cooperative, partially observable, and therefore focused on theory of mind. And as a consequence, this is a great test bed for two different research questions. First of all, I can think about self-play. How can I learn near optimal policies in this setting? But also, I can use this for thinking about human eye coordination. And those will be the next two parts of the talk, which I hope will be a bit more new and exciting for everyone here. So, the first part is about self play. And here we developed a method called the Bayesian Action Decoder for Deep Multi Agent Reinforcement Learning. Let's think a little bit about what actually communication is and how we can model it from a computational point of view. 
So we have our little Hanabi set up, but we have Bob. Bob is not cheating. He's holding the cards away from himself. And Bob has some belief over his own hand. He's reasonable what he might be holding. It's the probability of the hand of Bob. Alice then takes a look at Bob's hand and decides that she's going to discard her fifth card. And the question is, what does this mean about the hands that Bob is holding? Well, this is nothing but the Bayesian posterior. So we have the probability of the hand of Bob given the action of Alice, which is just this Bayesian posterior as shown on the right-hand side. And we can just fill in the numbers. So it's probably the, the action given the hand times the prior belief or normalized. However, if there was a way for Bob to know exactly what the mapping is that Alice used to go from observations to actions, then we can actually calculate this posterior. Okay? And what this, showed, what this shows you is that when you're doing learning and deck POM DPs, the logic of how policies, actions, and transitions are connected has fundamentally been, been changed. In an MDP, I only care about what happened. The state and the action provide the conditional distribution for the next state. P of S prime given S comma I. In contrast, in a deck POM DP, the next belief of Bob conditions not just on the previous belief that he had and the action taken by Alice, but also on the policy that generated that action. And that's crucial. If we're in a deck POM DP setting, my policy pi acts as an observation function for other agents in the environment. Because I look at the world and I produce an action. If they can observe my action, then they have to know what the mapping was that went from observations of one agent to the actions of the other agents. How do you denote the policy over here? Is it based on a sequence of actions or some, some other representation? Great. So here, for simplicity, I'm assuming that the policy just maps from the hand of Bob to the actions of Alice. So it only looks at the private observation and produces an action. But this tells you clearly we have to have different mappings depending on the common knowledge we're in right now. What this tells you is there are a few consequences we have to explore over these policies. So Alice has to think about all the common knowledge right now, explore over policies, by that. And then the policy being used has to be common knowledge to all agents in the environment. Because if you don't know what policy was being used to map from private observations to actions, then you can't do space and posterior. And we have to calculate the correct belief for each of the possible policies that's being explored. So these policies go from private observations to actions. But what policy we, we use uses all the common knowledge history that so far happened in the environment. And I've been using a concept that I haven't yet introduced. What is common knowledge? Common knowledge are things that are known to all agents to be known to all agents at infinity. And in particular in Hanabi, uh, everything that happens on the board, so the, the decks of cards that have been played, the fireworks, the hint tokens, and the last actions of agents, are all observed by all agents. The only thing that's private are the hands of Alice and Bob. So what we will do is we will use a public belief over private features to track the entire common knowledge history, and that becomes our belief. And the important part about this is that we avoid infinite recursive reasoning. Because if everyone was acting on private beliefs, then obviously I have to reason over your belief after every belief over belief. So this point is a little dense. Everyone looks slightly confused. Thanks for having the video on. So what is, what is a common knowledge? What's a public belief? It's nothing but a distribution of the things that are not common knowledge, the private features, conditioned on everything that is common knowledge. And this includes the of the board, but also the actions that were previously taken and what policies produce those actions. Because remember, only if I know what policy was being used at a given time step, can I then do the Bayesian update. So it's Bayesian belief that conditions on all actions taken so far and the policies that produced it and considers all the observations that are common knowledge to all agents. And that becomes our state representation. Still a little bit abstract, so I'm going to go a little bit more into detail. Okay, so we're assuming here 
that we have this Bayesian belief at some time step T, that's common knowledge to all agents. We have a new public observation. We know what policy was being explored before, the mapping from private observations to actions, and we know the action taken. Remember, all the ingredients on the right-hand side are common knowledge. And that means I can now look at my previous public belief. I can look at the policy that was being used, the mapping from private observations to actions, and I can look at the action taken. And that means I can simply go through this belief now and rule out all the states that are inconsistent with the action taken. So you know what Alice would have done in every possible observation she has. I know what Alice did, and I can simply see which of these hands of Bob are consistent with the action that Alice took. And therefore, this Bayesian posterior here is again common knowledge. So Jacob, may I ask a question? Please. So um, you started from this sort of fully multi-agent place, but then you've sort of made a couple of important assumptions, right, about this sort of common policy or common rewards and now sort of common policy knowledge over this. How close are we getting back to a situation where you effectively have one agent and you just have sort of sequential, you know, unknown knowledge in each period? Uh, you have a fantastic segue now for my next two slides. We've gotten there exactly, right? So um, yeah, great question. All of this, if you go through this, if you can do it, you've reduced deck P into a single agent setting. And that's because if we're doing all of this, we actually have a new state. So we had a previous state, which was all these like, you know, histories and recurring neural networks, yeah, that, and multiple agents. If you're doing what we just described, then you get a new state, this as bad, which consists of the public belief over private features and the public observation. You have a new action space rather than sampling actions, you're sampling entire policies at every time step. You're exploring over policies that go from private observations to actions. And then there's sort of like a latent mechanic of how these actions get executed by the acting agent that produces an action, an environment action from this. We have a, another latent state transition. And then we get the actual state, state transition where it produces new belief based on everything that happened so far and the last poison, the last action. And this really is a new MDP. So this is what we call the public belief MDP or PAP MDP for short. And here there is a Markov state, which are, is this public belief over features and the public features. We have a new action space, which is writing down policies for, for the acting agent. And we have this sort of like more complicated state transition. So we've now reduced this entire problem to a single agent setting, okay? Which means we've, got, we've gotten rid of all the complexities, but arguably also of some of the nice aspects of the interesting things that happen when you have multi-agent learning. We've now transformed this DECPOM DP into a single agent MDP. So in principle, you can use, you can solve this um, using any type of you know, feed forward deep reinforcement learning. Bearing in mind that your action space is to write down policies for the acting agent. Because for every policy you explore, you'll get not just a different environment action, but also a different posterior belief. Okay, and uh, we can talk a bit more about details if you're interested, but I'd also like to go um, to the next part of the talk, which resolves the assumption that you can do self-play, right? The reason that this works is what you alluded to is that we can do self-play. We can actually not just agree exactly on a policy, but we can agree on an exact way that we're exploring in policy space, right? This only works if the policy being explored is common knowledge to all parties. So we have perfectly correlated randomness, which doesn't break the observability constraint because we can do centralized training, decentralized execution, but it does break the spirit of coordinating with anyone else outside my training group. And that's what we'll get to in the next part of the talk. But first of all, so just, just sorry, go ahead. But just clarifying. So this reduction to the single agent setting that depends on both them all sharing the same reward function and also uh, all sampling from the same uh, bad policy, right? The BAD policy. So if you didn't share the same reward function, you could still do something like this, but obviously you'd have different rewards, but the mechanism would still work. Obviously you wouldn't want to share your random seat, right? So here sharing the random seat maximize information between my action and my observation, which is the goal, which is the goal in fully cooperative settings. We want to maximize the amount of information conveyed through my policy, which becomes your observation function, right? 
That's why it's so important that you know what's the observation function that's generating this, this current observation, my action. In the adversarial setting, like poker, it's the opposite. I actually want to use the fact that you don't know my seed to try and hide as much information as I can, which is where you get bluffs and things like that, where, where in a very targeted way, obfuscate information. But the same mechanism otherwise works, you just wouldn't share the random seed. You can still think of a public lease and all that, or that the formalism flows through one on one. Right. And obviously, you know, this deck form is a very hard and XP complete. So that tells you that this reduction actually has a very, very high cost, very large action space. And then in the actual paper, we had to do a lot of mechanics to get this to work. It was a fairly painful process, and I wouldn't have been able to do it without amazing collaborators. So this is, um, but we did it. And this was the first time that we had a deep reinforcement method that started from scratch that was a state of the art in Anabi. So in Anabi, you can get five times uh, five stacks of cards, which means um, 25 points in total. Not all games are winnable, but we got 24.2 points on this counting convention. And we also beat every single bot that existed before in terms of win rates. So getting the percentage of max of optimal gameplay of 25 points uh, up to almost 60%. And Firefly was a search bot that also used heuristics, um, was hard coded. We didn't even know about it, but then we ended up being lucky, I guess, by having 58% win rate. Um, but Jacob, can I interrupt and ask a question please, about the gameplay? Oh, yes. About uh, finesses, that's a specific move that happens uh, amongst Hanabi players. Were finesses used in winning these games? And were these trained without you hard coding? Uh, so, A, this bot has nothing hard coded. Right, so like let's let's be very clear. This bot simply starts from like, and we implement the Bayesian action decoder, which, which means we have belief dynamics and we have a way to sample policies rather than sampling actions. There's nothing hard code about the bot. Uh, finesses were not used, and I think I have a pretty good understanding on why finesses aren't used. Um, I don't think you need them. If you can actually do self play, I don't think you need to do finesses. And let me explain this a little bit more. So this bot will do things like hinting red or yellow to play the newest card. It will also use color codes to discard the last card, right? And this bot was extremely strong. So this is a quote from David Wu, who created this uh, competing bot beforehand. The bot is very strong in the early game. Its convention set is over far more efficient than human convention sets. It's really quite beautiful. So I think the takeaway here is, and we know this for three, four, five player Hanabi, if you can have arbitrary conventions, you do not need finesses because you can simply agree on weird coding schemes that sort of break the partial observability. And to some extent, that is exactly the goal in self play settings that are partially observable. I want to get rid of partial observability because it's really annoying. So I'm going to find some way of utilizing the fact that you can observe my actions to encode whatever information I want that's most efficient into my actions. And my belief is the finesse is not that. The finesse is something very different, which gets us directly to the last part, last set of things in this talk, which is coordinating with agents other than your trading partners. Because the assumptions we've made so far, you can know the exact policy and you're trained together and, 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 and. As satisfied in some settings, like when you want to, you know, train a drone swarm, but they're almost never satisfied in, in, in a lot of other settings. And that's coordination. I work together with agents based on a limited set amount of common knowledge. So one of the motivating examples here is human eye coordination. So let's think about this. We have the human and the robot. So it's obviously a multi-agent problem. And it's fully cooperative because the goal here is for this robot to help the human. And it's also going to be pretty generally partially observable. For a start, I don't know the exact reward function of this human, because it's a human, right? So it's fully cooperative, partially observable. Everyone now knows that's a deck from DP. So first thing here is human eye coordination is deck from DP, and that had been known before. It had been presented like that. But there's a caveat. It's not just any deck from DP, or the, the, because we also can't pre-agree on an action in each possible state. There's no way I can train with this human in a centralized fashion, take a trillion samples for every possible state of the world, and then agree on an exact policy. And that means we have to think about zero shot coordination, because the things that we did before in the, in the self-play part of the talk will clearly fail. That gets me to the issue. In the last part, I assumed 
a problem setting, which is so standard in fully cooperative settings that it's not even named. And that's the self-play setting. In the self-play setting, there is a single goal. And that is during training, maximize the performance that this exact team of agents obtains when being tested in that exact same constellation. And this is kind of a good idea. So if you do variations of this that find Nash equilibria, then you're doing something sound in two players or some. And that's because all the Nash equilibria are interchangeable. It doesn't matter which one I play. As long as I play Nash equilibrium, I'm guaranteed not to lose a test time. And if my goal is to beat other humans, not losing is a pretty good start. In contrast, in fully cooperative settings, these policies will in generality only perform well within that specific team of agents that they're trained with. And you can imagine if you don't even do well with an independent train, trained team of agents, you will probably fail with other agents at test time. And we can see this. So if you look at the self-play policies from before, this is a different method. It's called a simplified action decoder. That was a, an evolution of the Bayesian action decoder that was very, very uh, simplified and also less effective or beautiful, but it worked well in Hanabi. And what we're doing here is we're taking we're taking independent runs of the same method. So we're doing self-play 11 times over, 12 times over, so, and we're matching independent seats at test time. Okay, And what you can see is on the diagonal, we get these 24 something points in expectation. And on the off diagonal, everything is near zero. Not surprising if you remember the conventions. If you use red or yellow to play the newest card and white and blue to discard the last card, that's highly, highly arbitrary, right? So this drone swarm is gonna do great within itself, but if you ever have an independent trained drone swarm, they will fail completely at testing. And this is something that we both formalize as desiderata and also address partially in our paper called Other Play for Zero-Shot Coordination. So let's first introduce the zero-shot coordination problem setting, where the goal now is to do independent training between two different teams. But we're gonna train them in a way that allows them to coordinate at test time when they're being matched in this weird crossplay fashion where we take half of one team or like a few agents from one team, a few agents from the other team. And our overall goal is that the coach is going to agree on a training strategy before training starts. And the question is, what should the strategy be, right? We know that the strategy should not be uh, to do self-play because that's going to fail, right? So we need new algorithms because self-play obviously is a problem setting and also a, um, a learning method. So does this mean, now you're going to be thinking, oh, well, but like, what if I have two episodes together and then I can adapt and then on a third episode, I get evaluated and is an adaptation part of a coordination? Zero -shot coordination can capture all of that, right? That's important because episodes are extensive. So I, have, I can have multiple steps where I can observe previous actions and I can adapt to the others. But the key is we need to formalize that the desiderata here is adapting optimally given the minimal amount of common knowledge, which is the problem setting and the training method, right? So I can't agree on a strategy to play football. I can only agree on a training scheme for these teams. Are there any questions on this framing? Because this social coordination problem, I think is, a, is kind of important for the rest of the talk. Are you allowed to agree on a random seed? No. Not. You're not allowed to agree on hyperparameters. Really, I think zero-shot coordination, we framed it wrong in a sense in the initial paper because we said it's the same algorithm. We allowed for code to be shared. I think really here, there should be no code or training framework or anything else is shared. So it's independent implementations of the same algorithm and no hyperparameters or code can be shared between the parties. But the problem setting is common knowledge, right? But, but when you say they agree on a training strategy, I mean, could that be thought of as a prior over the hyperparameters? Or? Um, well, the issue with the prior of hyperparameters is that it includes a delta function, and then you can agree on a seat. So, <laughs> so, so let's, say, let's say we assume that, it, that you know, some broad distribution, everyone has access to the kind of hyperparameters that are used in machine learning, the kind of common knowledge to the world. Let's assume okay. there's like some very fuzzy definition of like a very broad distribution of hyperparameters. Okay, I'm, I'm okay with that, right? Okay. But you can't share code. You can't share, certainly can't share any hyperparameters per se, right? But you can agree on training algorithm. 
And then you're going to implement this thing independently and you're going to train your agents and then you're going to run them in an episode. And not the episode could is defined as part of the problem setting, but it could be you play three games of an and the fourth one counts, right? That could be the episode here. Because it obviously, even within one episode, you can adapt because you can observe my prior actions. But the point is, you're not trying to adapt to self-play policies, which is a non-goal because they are cryptic. You're not trying to adapt, you're not trying to do ad hoc team play um, with a set of other bots, because if you specify those bots, it becomes a single agent problem. It's just a problem DP of playing the best response to a pool, right? So it's defining both sides of the equation. It's giving you an objective that machine learning scientists can maximize. And I believe that this gets us much, much closer to human eye coordination without actually requiring humans, but instead by understanding the fundamental principles of coordination. It's a way that you can start doing machine learning without having to do human testing the entire time because you have a proxy goal for human eye coordination. Are there more questions? Could you perhaps motivate why it's the training strategy is the thing? Why is that the thing that you want to agree on uh, ahead of time? Well, it's kind of pragmatic. What else would you agree upon? Perhaps some set of skills that you want to get to in whatever way you'd like. And then at test time, you can come up with a strategy based on the skills everyone has learned, something of that form. Well, because this is agnostic to the, it's not even the training strategy needs to be agnostic to the deck from DP. So what something I didn't say is the coaches don't get told that they're playing football beforehand. They have to agree on a strategy for training these teams that's going to be robust to any deck from DP that's given to both parties for training. So you agree on a strategy for training before you get access to the specific game that needs to be played. The point that I was making is that there might be a way to get to that same set of skills that you eventually want with a number of different methods. So the question is more, why is it that you're fixing one particular method when the thing that you're actually trying to get to is skills that will be effective in whatever sort of combination of team players you use? Well, I think the idea of a skill is really making very strong assumptions about the type of tech from VP. You're really thinking about, you know, football where you can maybe think of atomic skills like dribbling and I'm not claiming that this is that you can't do break this problem apart. Like if you have lower level skills that you know, if you actually have a robot that needs to carry out like specific skills, I think that you should probably just do independently. But I think at the high level of the coordination space where it's about uh, adapting to others, um, I think this is the correct framing, right? Because skills are sort of they're very problem specific. You need to know a lot about the world. You know, I can come up like. How can I put this? Even this, the point of view that you have skills that you can talk about, that that's a meaningful abstraction, is already making a strong assumption about deck DP. And I'm looking for the general concepts of coordination. Yes, I suppose I was proposing that you court that the technical version of that would be that you condition on the task rather than on the training strategy, for example. Condition on the task. Um, like condition on the fact that you will be playing football, even if you don't want to specify some set of skills. Just okay, we're going to be playing football. We need to learn some way to play football, and then you can pick players from each team after the fact. It just seems that there are multiple different things you could condition on here, potentially. So maybe the, this is not quite clear yet. So you and me have to agree. The problem is like, like such. Okay, we know that we will be um, independent training agents according to some strategy, what, what, what have you. And then tomorrow is the game, or well, five games, that my agent and your agents have to play together, right? So I can't agree on a policy because I don't, between us, not common knowledge yet, what sport it's going to be. We don't even know it's going to be a sport. We don't know if it's going to be playing football or playing Hanabi or writing a book together, right? So you and me have to, and then our team shouldn't be training all these things. Our team should just be good at that thing that's going to be required tomorrow. So the, 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 you and I agree on, a, on something. Maybe this is skills, maybe this is something else. In my mind, this is a training strategy or an algorithm we're gonna to run today. Tomorrow you and me get access to the problem setting. We can train our agents independently. And then by Friday next week, we're gonna be done training and we ship our agents and they get evaluated together for five games or whatever that thing was. I understand the setting. I'm, I guess I'm, the question is more than why is that the setting? Why is it that you don't know the task that you're going to be trained on during that coordination step? Uh, during the training step, and then you'll train on it during the training step, and then you get evaluated during the testing step, right? So, 
to because make we're sure looking it, at it for the general principles that I take from the piece and uh, that I that are invariant across technologies. I'm looking for a general strategy for obtaining policies that can coordinate at this time. Okay, I, I sort of see the motivation behind that. All right, thank you. I'm looking for like the problem saying that if we address this, we have addressed coordination. And that means it needs to be, you know, agnostic to the technology being used. And it needs to be agnostic to the exact implementation that was used, agnostic to the seeds, agnostic to all these things. And obviously everything we have right now is the opposite, right? We overfit not just to the specific parts of stress time, but to a training time, but also to our technology as well. Right? So that's the problem setting. And I think this is a daunting problem setting. I don't think this is easy, but I think it's something that we can actually measure and make progress on, which to the best of my knowledge had not existed for addressing this specific question I'm trying to address, which is breaking away from self-play, which has been the de facto default towards coordination. Any more questions? I think that's it for me, thank you. Fantastic, great questions. Um, so I will go a little bit faster now. The next thing is very simple. So this was sort of like the first thing you're gonna do if you care about coordination rather than self-play is to think about symmetries and equivalences. So deck pomity piece are trees where we have nodes and edges, states, actions, observations, yeah, like that, like here. And then imagine that you have a tree where there's red and yellow and you can switch them out and you get the same tree on the right-hand side. So we've switched two nodes out, we've changed the labels and we get the same tree. That means that uh, it's a symmetry. So red and yellow in this tree are equivalent. So we can define equivalence classes and we can extend this idea of equivalences to the entire deck from the P. So if you have some set of phi's, mapping spies that take in states, actions, observations and produce exactly the same tree again, once you've shuffled all the things in the tree, then that's the symmetry of the deck from the P. And because you can apply it to the entire set of all states, actions and observations, you can also apply it to policies because I can simply think of a policy uh, pi prime, which acts on a deck from the P after applying this entire reshuffle, okay? And because these equivalences, um, if I take a joint policy, uh, pi one and pi two, and I apply this to before or after shuffling, I get the same reward, I get the same return. Are there any questions on these symmetries? Uh, I think that that's a no. So the question is, what, how can we use those symmetries? And uh, let's start off by self-play. So what is self-play? Self-play is maximizing the joint policy, pi, which consists of pi one and pi two. And I, just want to find the optimal return j. Instead, in other play, I'm not allowed to optimize both policies exactly. I can only specify my policy pi two up to a set of equivalent policies phi of pi two. So basically, if I have a joint policy by one by two, and I think it's fantastic, and I think everyone should play it, it's just as reasonable to play phi of pi two because phi of pi two is equivalent. Right? So I have to be robust to my symmetries being broken inconsistently at test time. And I model that process during training. And what this actually does is that it calculates an expected future return for an entire equivalence class of policies. So rather than maximizing for a specific software policy, I'm now maximizing for an equivalence class of policies. And by that, I become robust to symmetry breaking at test time. So I'm going to find a policy that doesn't have inconsistent symmetry breaking. And because this is simply an asymmetric domain randomization, I can implement this on top of any deep reinforcement algorithm at training time. And what does this look like? So in other play, we have these two teams that we're training again. However, at every step in the episode, half the team is getting exposed to some weird random perturbation of the environment, only half the team. It's not domain randomization, it's kind of team randomization where you know if left and right get shuffled, then suddenly mechanics change, things like that. Right? And then I do this for both teams independently, every episode in the game, and then I test them in crossplay again. Right? And in Hanabi, the symmetries uh, are very simple. They simply the colors. Colors are arbitrary labels. And what this means is one agent will see the world under shuffling of those labels. So my, my red is your green in one episode, it becomes your yellow in another episode. Okay? And that obviously prevents agents from learning arbitrary color codes because I can no longer coordinate on the color. Jake, can I ask another question? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I guess I was just wondering, like, that seems to work well in a very diff limited state space, or, you know, in, in your case, the colors, I guess, is not really state space, but like these sort of actions, but it seems like most of the human robot interactions we can imagine would be in very 
very, very large ones where either it would be very hard to tell that or even just like finding those equivalence classes would be very, very computationally expensive. Can you talk about that a little? Yeah, so other play assumes that the equivalence is a common knowledge. So with the deck from DP, you get a set of symmetries provided to you, right? And that's that like gets around that problem. It's also kind of silly. <laughs> so, <laughs> I want to move on from other play in the next, but you raise a good point. Again, when you get to robots, I think you want to do something like was suggested before, learn skills first, and then have a more high, high level abstraction of the, of the setting where you can think about equivalences and symmetries and things like that, right? I don't think playing things like, you know, if you have to play Hanabi with a robot with a human, I don't think doing that end-to-end -end is a good idea, right? I think you first want to learn some form of abstraction of the game, which covers symmetries and equivalences. Learn good strategies at the high level and then learn how to execute those strategies. I think that's, I don't, I don't think that, you know, we will get there that we can get a robot to pick up cards and play an Abbey end to end. And in that high level space, I think you can think about these concepts, but I also want to move away from symmetries. I think they're very limiting. So, uh, great question. So what did this do? It, it improved uh, cross-play scores. So you go from, you know, 2.5 to 15 points in cross-play. And then if you add an auxiliary task, you get even more cross-play. And also this really validated uh, kind of like the, the underlying hypothesis that if you move towards zero shot coordination, we will also help get, develop things that are better at playing with humans. So the average performance of our other play bot shown on the y-axis here when paired with a human in a single game of Hanabi was around 16 points. And the average self-play performance shown here on those same decks of cards was nine points. So other play learns more human compatible policies without requiring any human data. And I think we've discovered sort of like the first principle of coordination, those shall not choose a policy from a set of equivalent but mutually incompatible joint policies if you're trying to work with a stranger. Um, this had a lot of issues because symmetries are brittle. They only work if you have exact understanding of the world and they have to provide it by the environment. So we have a very new piece of work called off-belief learning that addresses some of these challenges in settings where the largest coordination issue is assigning meaning to actions. Let's talk about this quickly again. So what we saw before is in self-play, rather than using grounded information, which is, you know, this card is blue, this card is red, blue and red completely lost their semantic meaning. Blue did not mean anything about this card. It meant discard your second card, things like that, right? And this is a little bit like a bee wiggle dance where agents break partial observability by taking weird actions that mean something to other agents. And that will obviously fail at test time because a human doesn't understand that, you know, red should mean discard your third card. And importantly, even under other play, there might still be many weird ways of encoding information. So for example, uh, discarding the fourth and fifth card are not equivalent. So in principle, discarding the fourth card could mean anything. And we deep, we've seen policies that say, if I discard my fourth card, you should play your second card, right? So the question is, can we train RL agents that cannot at all, in any, in any way or form, exchange information like this in that cryptic way, but still play, play optimal otherwise? And the problem is, if you do self-play, then obviously each agent can observe the actions of others. Your policy introduces correlations, all agents pick up on it, and you get into the self-play loop where you can form arbitrary conventions. That's the goal. First of all, can we do it? And then how do we do it? Imagine I sit down with you and they say, hey, let's play Hanabi. You know, I just met you and we can't agree on many rules, but we're going to agree that we will only assign grounded meaning. When I say four, I just mean this card is four. And when I say red, I just mean card is red. And it's common knowledge that you and I are doing this and we'll assume others are also doing it. We're going to play off and according to this. How do you train that agent? That's the goal of off-belief learning, addressing this fundamental challenge that partial observability gets broken in multi-agent learning. Does anyone have an idea for how we would do it? Well, yeah, I saw someone to speak. Okay, in that case, I'll tell you. You're going to have a new algorithm that's called off-belief learning. Off-belief learning starts with a policy pi zero that's given as an input. And we're going to make that any policy that doesn't look at private observations. For example, 
a fully random uniform random policy. Now, the algorithm assumes that all prior actions were taken by that random policy, which means they carry no posterior meaning. But I'm going to play optimally according to the belief that that produces. And I'm going to assume in that optimal gameplay that all future actions are taken by that same optimal policy, pi one, which again interprets all past actions as coming from pi zero. Does that make sense? And um, let me maybe go one slide ahead. So, you know, first card is red means this card is red, cannot mean anything else, because if a random agent decides to tell you a card is red, it truly can't mean anything else. It can only mean this card is red. Okay. So let me go ahead a little bit. And um, so one important concept here is the grounded belief. So in general, this is the, the Bayesian posterior. This is probably of the state world trajectories, tau, given some private observation history, tau i that was produced by some policy by zero, right? This is that same Bayesian posterior, a little bit more explicit, right? So it now depends on the action observation histories of all age, other agents, and now we're using A for the action. And what you can see is in this Bayesian posterior, if pi zero doesn't depend on tau, tau, uh, tau t i minus one, it will cancel and on the top of and bottom. In other words, my Bayesian posterior, if my counterpart didn't look at the state of the world at the private observation, does not depend on what policy they played. A blind agent cannot communicate information. And in particular, that means any blind policy is going to produce the same Bayesian posterior, which is this grounded belief. And we're going to use the fully random, the uniform random one, not because it matters, but because that's something that everyone has access to. And something that's very easy to specify. So we're going to assume that everyone at pi zero, we're going to assume that pi one assumes everyone else was playing pi zero, which is a fully random policy so far. And then I'm going to play optimally ever after, knowing that others will also interpret my actions as coming from there and will play optimally according to this. This concept is kind of important. So if you have any questions right now, um, yeah, let me know. Can you explain that statement that if the random policy tells you that your card is red, it can only mean your card is red. It seems that it can't, it doesn't mean anything at all. It's, it's well, just a random no, policy. sorry, I should be clear. The dynamics in Anabi are such that the hints can never be lying, they're revealing. Oh, so okay. If a random policy decides to hint Right, you cannot give illegal hints in, in the game. I see. I read the rules of the game, but I have not played it personally. Right, no, that's fine. So that's a very, very good point. Thank you. Right, the rules, the mechanics are such that you know, if you play the on the computer or something, I can click and I can reveal hint, I can reveal color or number of a card, and that's going to reveal all the cards numbers of that same set of cards. Right, I can't lie. Right. So if a random policy decided to reveal, let's use it reveal the color of these sets of cards, then that is the color of the sets of cards. Is there an analog to this in a sort of a good spread of tasks? It seems very specific to Hanabi. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out where you would take this idea and apply it to sort of other more general tasks. Well, but yeah, so I think, for example, if you have any grounded protocol, say you're a human and you've got language, but you want the robot to use language, you want the robot to use the communication channel that's actually there explicitly where things mean things. Like the indicator in a car means cars are going to turn right or left. You don't want a deceleration or like a slight wiggle of this, the steering wheel to mean something completely different, right? So whenever you have a given protocol that reveal, is supposed to re reveal something about the world or correlate with the world, and you don't want agents to deviate from this protocol, but you want them to use the protocol optimally and then play optimally ever, ever after. So this is true for protocols where you only have access to certain tokens if that token corresponds to something true about the world or something similar to that? It's true for protocols where I can specify what the distribution state of the world was, would be if you had acted according to the protocol. So if I can say, if I can say, you know, if you hint red, this means that this card is red. If you indicate left, that means the card is going to turn left, right? That's then I then I can hear his policy. 
because then I can produce a belief function that says, this is what the state of the world would be if you had taken this action under that policy. And that's true. Very Thank you. Great questions. Thank you. More questions. So, oh yeah. So, so can I ask, so it seems like um, in sort of your first, I forget, it was like high, high principle of, of doing this, right? You said, don't, don't have, don't signal things that are, that are, that could have an equivalent strategy that, that means something else. And now you're sort of saying, now we're going to limit ourselves all the way down to things can only mean what they literally mean. Yeah. Right. It seems like there might be a space in between those two where you say like, every signal that I send that is literal must be literal, but I can also make up a small number of new signals, right? Mm -hmm. And so maybe the robot has like a little light that goes on, or we all agree that if I like, you know, wheel my shoulders, the Amazon robot shouldn't run me over <coughs> or something like that. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, can you talk a little bit about that continuum? Yeah, so there's two answers to this. The first answer is, I'm not going to talk about, I'm going to skip through technicalities now because we are running out of time. I'm not sure how strict this uh, the time limit is, but I like the discussion a lot more than I like uh, running through slides. So if you all believe me that I can train this thing, right? Let's, let's say I know how to train this thing and I can scale it to deep reinforcement and whatnot. And uh, we, we do that. Then um, there are two answers. First of all, I can actually, I can iterate this process. So if I want to introduce meaning, what I can do is I can start with this completely grounded policy um, that assumes everything came from random pi zero or some other set of conventions. I train a policy pi one, and then I use that policy as the meaning for the next level, pi two. So pi two is going to assume that the all actions previously were taken by pi one. So if pi one has figured out some other way of playing games, so for example, let's go through Hanavi here. Where you know, obviously, what Pi Zero needs to do is fairly clear. It needs to hint the Kalen rank of playable cards. Because if I know the Kalen rank, I don't care what policy told me that this is a this is a yellow three. If the yellow three is playable, I can play it no matter what policy told me that it's a yellow and a three. Because I can look at the board, I know it's a yellow, it's a, it's a three. There's a yellow two on the board, I can play it, right? So Pi One is going to learn to use ground information optimally. But what does that mean? It means when Pi 2 assumes that all prior actions were taken by Pi 1, then suddenly Pi 2 knows if you're going to start hinting for a card, it's most likely playable. So Pi 2 can do things like, well, you just told me it's a 3, but you only tell me these colors and numbers of playable cards, so I know I'm going to, I'm going to, I can play this already without you having to tell me the second token. So the optimal behavior, according to one convention, then becomes the defining, the convention defining behavior for the next level. And this can do things like carefully, in a very controlled way, introduce loops of counterfactual factual reasoning. Where if I assume that we start from some common knowledge, which is ground information, what playstyle does that introduce? And then what can I derive from that playstyle? And I'm not going to do an infinite number of loops, I'm going to do a few loops, two or three or four loops of that reasoning. That's one thing. What we cannot do with off belief learning is use cheap talk. We absolutely cannot learn that a signal here, the light bulb on or off, means that there's a cat or a dog behind the fence. And that's something that we should be able to do with a method in zero-shock coordination. And why is that? Because episodes can be extended. Zero-shock coordination, in opt optimal zero-shock coordination, requires you to be able to say, hey, you know, when I turn on the light, I mean X, Y, Z. If I am allowed to ground out new signals in my in my episode, I should be able to introduce symbols and off-belief learning cannot do this. So off-belief learning highlights what can be done by bootstrapping well-controlled counterfactual reasoning processes and really shows you what the gap is. And the gap is introducing signals, but not arbitrary, introducing those signals that can be understood by other agents at this time. So the way, the way you just described that, it sounds like a lot of what economists call like iterative elimination of dominated strategies. Is that, is there any connection between that? I'm not sure if that's a literature that, you know, that this literature talks that about is, very much. That is, that is uh, related, but again, we're trying to use the structure of the deck DP rather than just a payout table for coordination, right? These are not dominated strategies. Remember like these are optimal, like, I mean, all the weird color coding and whatnot, that's all optimal. These are optimal self-based strategies, right? So if I'm just trying to eliminate dominant strategies, I'm not going to get anywhere in Hanabi, right? 
in the, in the self play coordination setting, I'm not going to get anywhere. I have to look at the structure of the deck from DP and then derive how I can coordinate based on that, right? And in particular, if there's like 10 steps of, uh, of interactions between Alice and Bob and they have to coordinate over this, the cat and the dog, right? Yes, Alice should be able or Bob to introduce that this light bulb means something about the world, right? But what self play could do in those 10 steps, self play could completely shuffle the protocol every time step. Cut, you know, Light on means dark on the even steps, light off on the odd steps. That's self, optimal self play, no problem at all, right? And in fact, if you tabular learning, that's what you will get. The fact that our self play policies aren't even weirder is because our deep RL algorithms are kind of lazy and they learn the simple things first. But that's an artifact. It doesn't come out of a principal objective, right? But what off belief learning tells you is this is how far you can get without this, right? Um, we're running out of time, but I do want to show you. So this has a lot of nice properties. It's a policy improvement operator. Produce a unique policy, yeah, da, 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 da. You can run it in, in a hierarchy. And uh, you can implement it as a fictitious transition mechanism where we have a new target state. That's what would the world be if someone had played according to this policy so far and I observed the state. I then get a new transition and I boots up to this target. And it works in this nice toilet setting, which is, which is linked out. And also in Hanabi, it produces this really nice uh, policy where you can see this progression at the level one, it really uh, bots mostly play cards where they know the rank and the color over 67%. And then as you iterate this, they start introducing conventions where they start playing only when they know the color. And it looks a lot closer to, to our human proxy, but the clone bot here in how it plays percent, uh, how it plays the game at level four. And also um, what's very nice is that if you go and iterate this process a few steps, you get these Amazingly high self play scores, 24.1. You get very consistent cross play. So it produces a very reliable same method on cross different runs. And also it plays well with these other bots. So this other play bot that we had before gets a high cross play score. The color hinting bot that's uh, sort of like out of team play, very different policy also does well. And it gets 16 points when being paired with a human in a much, much more stringent counting regime where bombing on counts is zero. So these bots are the most human-like Hanabi gameplay that any of us have ever seen coming out of learning system or a hard coding system for the matter, right? So these parts, not at the, at the first level, but if you iterate that process of introducing counterfactuals have very, very human-like gameplay. So those should not assign arbitrary meaning to symbols and actions unless you can do so based on the structure of the deck from DP and then do it carefully. Um, I am running out of time, so I'm going to skip to this. We've extended uh, coordination to this work, Rich Rider, which was published at NIRIPS, where we use eye of the Hessian to uh, solve coordination problems. Interesting work, it connects between supervised learning and zero-shot coordination and domain, domain general generalization. Uh, and then there's a lot of exciting work to do. I don't think we're done with this. I think this problem setting has huge amount of work to be done in it. But the issue is that it's very difficult to explain. And as we, as we discovered in this talk, um, communication is hard. So hopefully this was somewhat informative and I'll skip through all this future work to allow for any last minute questions. Oh, I do think we should go towards more high dimensional and complex settings like robots in the long term. But I think we probably have to cut them into two, high level coordination and communication and execution low level skills in this world. And then we should understand the emergent dynamics of multi-agent systems. And the talk summary is that uh, all of this is very exciting and we've made some progress and there's even more work to do. Go to my website, Love Code is linked out. And I'd like to thank you all for listening. And then if there's any last minute questions. Go for it. Yeah, thanks thank a lot, Jacob, for the wonderful talk. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. yeah. Good so questions, there, by the way. Yeah, there any you know, last minute questions? You know, we have two more minutes for any questions. Do you know what the uh, iterated off belief learning converges to? Um, it converges to an equilibrium. So it's going to be uh, locally at Nash equilibrium. So, you know, that's. I mean, I, I guess, like, do, do you know, like, can you characterize what it. In Hanabi to? or in generality? I guess in, in, any, in any sense. Um, okay. In, in general, it will find the optimal policy that can be found without assigning arbitrary meaning to tokens. So if you, if you bootstrap counterfactual reasoning, right? Um, so I think what it will do is it will do everything but cheap token. That's my intuition. My intuition is in these turn-based games that are partially observed, but they're going to piece, 
it will obtain the optimal coordination policy modulo utilizing TikTok. It will not use TikTok at all on paper. In reality, it will because life is messy and noisy and you can, you know, like unless you have uh, perfect learning, noise will amplify as you go up the hierarchy unless you do something about it. But it will learn the optimal policy that can be obtained without utilizing TikTok. And that obviously works amazingly in coordination because you and me can completely independently uh, calculate the policy. And this is actually off-belief learning was robust to changing things about hyperparameters and changing implementation, while other play was a lot more dependent on this, right? Because other play, you can imagine you're only taking out this one part of redundancy, the colors, and there might be a lot of space left, right? And the hyperparameters and the algorithm change the distribution over solutions you'll get, and that changes the outcome. In off-belief learning, at least on paper, you get a unique, unique policy at every level. I, I guess I'm like a little skeptical that it's a globally optimal and not just a local optima, because in some sense you're like initializing um, your initial like pi zero to a random player, and then sort of just following that to some convergence point. But we're not. But hang on a second. We're not following pi zero. So like let's. I mean, pi one is determined by pi zero, and then pi two is determined from pi one. Right. Eventually, you get somewhere, but. Um, do, Correct. I'm a little, I, yeah, I, I guess like I can look at the paper. Um, yeah, my, 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 this, is, this is interesting. I have to clarify, you're right. I don't have a proof for this, but my intuition is outside of cheap talk. So outside of like these true, outside of like truly equivalent, let me think about this more. No, I think you're right. I think you're right. I think you're, I, I have to take that back. I think it will learn something that like does well in coordination, but you can do better. If you have some other way of uh, bootstrapping or breaking ties. Um, yes. So even in, I think cheap, cheap talk is the obvious failure case, but I think I could construct another failure case where this could, where this could get stuck, right? But remember in the turn-based partial observable setting, the only challenge is partial observability is assigning meaning to, meaning to actions, right? Everything else looks a lot like an MDP. Right. And once you've agreed on that way, you, how you interpret the past, um, it really has the properties of an MDP where you can get guarantees for improvement. Great question. And I think it's, it's OK, I'm going to say it's an open question in generality where this converges to. It, it will be an equilibrium. But it's obvious that cheap talk can't be handled. And we have to be able to address cheap talk. Right? We have to be able to introduce symbols in the episode. Mm -hmm. that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Great Thanks. question. Thank you. Well, so let's thank Jacob for the wonderful talk. And I think Jacob is around for uh, some meetings. So I think now we'll switch off to the meetings. If you're more interested, feel free to reach out to Jacob and I'm sure he'll be happy to answer your questions. So thank you, Jacob. And, Great. You know, Thanks for having me. Have a good day. Yes, bye bye. Thank you. And Jacob, you have the link for the one-on-ones, right? Yeah, yeah, I do. All good. Okay. okay. Bye. Perfect.